uh, moving on quick because I had six and a half pages of notes today. So, um, but hopefully I'm not talking too fast and, and you guys are, are getting all this. As I go through these proofs, we have a couple of applications, a couple of lessons along the way. And then at the end, I'll summarize the proofs for you, the seven proofs at the very uh, tail end of today's teaching. So um, to me, this is just astonishing that the Jews were more concerned about the breaking of their rule, by the way, not God's law, but their interpretation of God's law. And, and so we're so hate filled and so angry that all they could see was this, this rule was broken and we have to kill Jesus. Now that brings us to our next lesson or our next application for today. Um, and to me, this, again, just the silliness of this, evidently plotting to kill someone through entrapment, subterfuge, uh, bribery, and trickery was all okay, while healing a man and telling him to take up his mat <laughs> and walk was terrible. Now, what's my point here? Guys, <laughs> this is where religion will take you every single time. No grace, no love, just rules and self-righteousness. The sometimes horrible history of the Christian church can always be traced back to this one thing. And I've said it a million times. I'll say it again. Religion kills. God is not about religion. People, it is about relationship. And this is so clearly illustrated in this story. When you see the links and the measures they went through to kill Jesus because um, he busted their rules, he busted their concepts of what the um, Messiah would be, and frankly, he threatened their power base, which I think has a lot to do with it. Uh, they sinned all over the place in order to, to, to kill Jesus. Now, Jesus makes this statement. It's the first one of our uh, seven that we're going to go over today. But he says, my father has been working until now, and I've been working. So the first thing I want you to notice, Jesus didn't try to explain that he had not truly broken the law on the Sabbath, but, but just one of their silly rules. Instead, he went further. He put an exclamation point on it. He underlined it three times for them. And he, he said, hey, listen, my father works on the Sabbath. And so I work on the Sabbath. Therefore, um, he was making himself, and they clearly understood this. If you read the last part of that passage, um, he's clearly putting himself in the same footing as, as God the Father. So this was blasphemy to these Jewish leaders. And by the way, it is blasphemy. If Marty declared himself to be God on today's broadcast, and it's not true, that's blasphemy. But the problem is, it was true. They had the creator, their own creator was standing before them, and they were accusing him of blasphemy. As amazing as that is, as startling as that is, that's what was happening. Um, he, he, he's saying, listen, I partake of the same nature as my father. And, and basically, that's saying I'm equal. One of the scholars leon morris wanted to point out something uh when he wrote about bro breaking the sabbath and then saying he said those words those verbs are in the continuous tenses so jesus at the tail end of that passage is saying i habitually am going to break your man-made sabbaths and i'm habitually going to declare myself equal with god so this isn't just for this occasion he did it continuously um, he didn't try to deny what they were saying because what they were saying is true. I did declare I'm equal with God because guess what? I am equal with God. So there's no rebuttal here. There's no, there's, if anything else, there's confirmation of it. Verses 19, 19 through 20. Then Jesus continued his discussion 
with these religious leaders. And it's almost more of a monologue at this point than it mm -hmm. is a dialogue. Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. I noticed it said marvel and not believe because none of these people he's talking to basically are going to believe. They're so hardened had their heart had become. But this discussion, and you think, well, why did Jesus, didn't Jesus know that their hearts were hard and they weren't going to receive it? You missed the point. In this extended discussion that's going to be this week and will continue on into next week, Jesus is explaining to the religious leaders some of the nature of his relationship and work with God the Father. Now, although they didn't care, it, is, it helps us to know more. It, it preserves for us throughout all time and all posterity's sake these unique characteristics of God the Father and God the Son. Because of this, we understand a lot of this. And like I said at the outset, it is pure ignorance when somebody says Jesus doesn't ever declare to be God or equal with God or any of that. That's absolute utter nonsense because this whole section of chapter five is that's all it's about. Um, the first, the second thing he says, the son can do nothing of himself. Jesus explained that he, as God, the son does nothing independent of God, the father. He was and is fully committed and fully submitted to the Father's will. Now, be very careful with this. This sub, now some people will teach that's true, but it was because he was inferior to God. This doesn't mean he did this out of inferiority or coercion or force. He willingly submitted to God the Father by choice. And, and, and relevant to this Sabbath controversy that we just talked about in the previous verses, this is Jesus' way of telling these religious leaders that I didn't tell the healed man to, to take up his mat and walk. Um, God did. And I did it in complete submission to what God told me to do. So this is going to infuriate them, by the way, even more. But it tell, teaches us a second important lesson that um, not only the nature being the same, but the submission of God the Son to God the Father is absolute, and it's by choice, not because of inferiority. Whatever he does, it says, the Son does in like manner. His work, Jesus' work, is a perfect reflection of the work and will of God the Father. When you see Jesus doing something, it, it tells us exactly what the work and the will of God the Father is. He is the perfect reflection of the Father. And notice one other thing. The Father's not passive in this. Um, it's, he's not like, oh, uh, let me try this out on Jesus and see if he gets it. See if he understands my will. Let him hunt around a little bit. See if he gets it. Because that's the way it sometimes feels for me when I'm trying to look for God's will. No, it was perfect. It was perfect. Um, the Father shows him. And Jesus does it. There's absolute 100% clarity in their relationship. Now, some people try, and, and, and again, I think we all have had this in our mind. We see these distinct differences between God the Father and God the Son, whether they're large or small. Um, some of the ways that we do that is we look at the Old Testament. And I, I, again, I hope I've thoroughly debunked this in Breaking Bread because it is the reason why I carry back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament and teach verse by verse. I sure hope one of the things that you guys have absorbed after 22 years is the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament, that God is just as full of grace and judgment in the Old Testament as he is full of grace and judgment in the New Testament. If you were with me through the teaching of the book of Revelation, there isn't a bloodier book in the entire Bible. And it's in the New Testament, and it's God's judgment upon the world. So this thinking is wrong. Uh, God's mean in the Old Testament. He's nice in the New. This is just all imbalanced, wrong thinking. 
Uh, it's stinking thinking. Clearly, God is the same throughout all times, throughout Old Testament, throughout New Testament. All right, moving on. Um, the father, he says, loves the son. This is a, 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 a little bit of an onion layer being peeled back about their relationship. The relationship between the first and the second members of the Trinity is not one of master and slave. It's not one of employer, employee. It's one of equals, father and son, and united together by love. And by the way, the tense again, the verb that's used here, it's a continuing, continual tense, meaning the father never ceases to love the son. The father always will love the son. And then he finishes, he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. All right. The, the religious leaders were, were kind of stunned by what Jesus was saying. He was saying he was God. And Jesus puts the cherry on top and says, oh, and you think uh, healing the paralyzed? You've just seen the tip of the iceberg. Hang around with me for the next couple of years. Um because we still haven't gotten chapter nine, I think it is, to the raising of Lazarus. So, so did, did Jesus really claim to be equal with God? Listen, if he had not, if he, that was their understanding, the Jewish leaders, if he knew that, oh gosh, they're thinking I'm God and I'm not, he would have explained to them their assumption is wrong and would have defended himself. He never, did you ever see him defending himself in any of this? No, he's confirming what they said. He's confirming that he is indeed one with the father. All right, then we're going to finish up verse 21 through 23. Looks like I'll make it today. One page left. Give some more qualities. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son, that he should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son. One second, let me let that in. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And that finishes our passage for today. Let me explain this. And then, like I said, I will summarize those seven proofs that John gives. We've heard five of them. I think there's two more to come. Some of them will be repeated in the later passages. But the first one is the father raises the dead and gives life to them. So the son gives life to whom he will. The son has the same power and authority to raise the dead and give them life as God the father does. We're going to see that in a couple of more verses. But Jesus has just told you the spoiler alert. I'm going to do this and you're going to see this and you're going to marvel more, more miraculous things are going to happen bigger than healing a paralytic for 38 years. It's hard to think of a greater power and authority than that to raise the dead. But they didn't want to think about who was standing in front of them and the abilities that he had. They focused on, on a, on a him as their, their little silly lawbreaker and a threat to their own power. They were literally blinded to who was standing in front of them. Jesus goes on, God the Father's committed all judgment to the Son. Now, they only thought God judged. And he says, no, actually, God has given the Son all that authority of judgment. Um, there's a division of labor between God the Father and God the Son. Um, it is before God the Son that people will stand on Judgment Day. It is before God the Son that Christians will appear before him on the Bema Seat to determine your rewards in heaven. It is before the white throne judgment that Jesus will sit on that non-believers will be judged and cast away from him, their punishments being meted out based on their life. So this is just a clear claim um, another clear claim to him being co-equal with God, because who would have this authority other than God himself? Now, Jesus, when he came the first time, as I've already mentioned in his own mouth, he said, I did not come here to judge the world, but I came here to save the world, to save the lost. But he will return a second time 
and he will come back as the judge of the world. Just read the book of Revelation. Then he says, and in closing, he said, all should honor the son just as they honor the father. Uh, he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Um, failing to honor God the son means it's impossible for you to honor God the father who sent the son. Why is this important? Because you can be a theist and believe in God but not believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if you don't believe, I'm the bridge. If you don't believe in me, if you don't honor me, then you can tell yourself everything you want to believe, but it isn't true. You're not honoring the father. You guys get that? It's an mm -hmm. important point. Um, and also, it's a point of idolatry and blasphemy. If Jesus really is not God and he's saying you need to honor me just like you honor God, that's that's idolatry. That's blasphemy. It's punishable by death. We see that all the way back to the Old Testament, unless he really is God. So so now I'm going to summarize and then we'll open it up for questions. Here are the seven um, proofs. Again, a couple of them we'll go over next week, but I'm going to tell you what they are this week by way of summation. Um, seven proofs. Uh, now, I'm going to give credit. I, I like this summary. There was a, a Bible commentator. His name's Jay Sidlow Baxter. He a long since gone, old-timey uh, Bible scholar. And he wrote this in the old King James Version. So I'm going to read it to you in the old King James Version, and I'm going to give you where those... Uh, scriptures lie in John chapter 5. So Baxter writes, Jesus claims equality to God in seven particulars, he calls them. The first particular is this. He is equal in working. Um, and what, where he quotes this is in verse 19 in the old, old English version. What things soever he the father doeth, those also doeth the son likewise. So Jesus is equal to God in working. Second particular, he's equal in knowing. And here he quotes verse 20. For the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. So whatever God knows, he imparts to God the Son, God the Father, and parts to God the Son, and they were equal in knowing. Third particular. And from here, this is in 21, but it's also going to be later next week. It reoccurs in 28 and 29. He's equal in resurrecting power, his ability to resurrect the dead. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, so the Son quickeneth whom he will. The fourth particular where Jesus claims he is equal to God. He's equal in judging. Uh, and this was, as we saw in verse 22, but it's also going to occur again in verse 27. For the father judgeth no man, but hath committed. You can't commit somebody to somebody. You can't commit an ability or a power to somebody unless you had it to begin with. The, but God hath committed all judgment unto the son. They are equal in judging. The fifth particular where Jesus claims to be God. They are equal in honor. And this we just read in verse 23, that all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. How are we doing? That's five. That shouldn't put the uh, uh, nail in the coffin, but we got two more. Now, these occur next week in a passage we have not read yet. He's equal in regenerating. That means uh, eternal life, not resurrection, but regenerating. And here he's quoting 24 and 25. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me is passed from death to life. And then the seventh and final particular where Jesus clearly claims to be God He's equal in self-existence. And he's going to talk about this in verse 26 
And here's the quote, for as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself. What does that mean? It means he's pre-existent. He was not created as some of the cults claim uh, that, that Jesus is a created being. That's nonsense. Jesus said himself. Uh, next week, we'll read that passage that um, I'm, I'm, I, I existed before time began. I'm, I'm existed right alongside God. I had no beginning point. Uh, I'll have no end point. Uh, so these are seven ways or seven particulars that Jesus clearly declared his equality to with God. Now go ahead and take yourselves off mute. We're finished for this week. You've got about 13 minutes for questions or comments. I have a question, and it's probably the stupidest question I could possibly ask. But... Love stupid questions. Love them. Okay, here's stupid question number one of the day. All right. Uh, we hear all of these things that God, and I use the term, gave to Jesus Christ, to Jesus. Was And we, we know that Jesus prayed to his father. We know that from, from uh, other, other books. Uh, if they are co-equal, did Jesus ever... Tell, ask, or instruct God to do something that he wanted him to do? Or was it always one way? Uh, by design, I believe the answer is one way, especially from the incarnation on, when Jesus took the form of humanity, of a, of a man, he submitted his perfection and will and had limitations of a human being and from that point on marty as far as i know it's not a dumb question it's a great theological question which you could take it back prior to the incarnation uh, and was it always that way is it that way now in heaven he sits at the right hand of the father in heaven but that still shows that god the father sits in the the main position seat if you will um so there is no inferiority. Uh, they are co-equal. They all have the same power, but they have three different distinct roles or persons um, that have different roles. The Holy Spirit's role is different from that. The Holy Spirit didn't come down and take the form of humanity, um, but he lives in humanity and it gives us the ability to hear God just as Jesus heard God, although obviously flawed. And his way of hearing from God was not flawed. So it wasn't a stupid question at all. But from at least from the incarnation and from that point going forward, yes, that's it was um, it was one way. And yes, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, if there be any other way, because he was tremendously suffering at that point. Mm -hmm. it was, his humanity was that wasn't sin. And, and when he was basically told in that moment, there is no other way that, that the cup's not going to pass. He has to drink of this cup. He submitted again to the Father's will perfectly. Bill, you had raised your hand. And then Marty probably has a second question, I think. No. No. It was, uh, I believe that Jesus was, again, fully God and fully human in his incarnation. And uh, being fully human, he was tempted. Uh, and uh, so he did have a choice of doing this or doing that. Uh, and he lived the perfect life that we're not able to live. Therefore, he could be the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb. Uh, when he says, uh, God, not my will, but your will be done, uh, Jesus could have said, I'm not going to go through with it. So he did have that independence to do so. It's not yes. like because you're, because. Uh, because you're Jesus, uh, you're God incarnate, you have to do God's will. He also was fully human. Otherwise, it would have been it would have been too easy. Sorry for saying it that way. It no, no. And from a theological standpoint, that's 100% correct. He had to be able to choose to disobey God and didn't because then in order for us to relate to him, for him to be our perfect sacrifice, he has to be able to be tempted 
and as Bill said, to be able to make a choice. Now, we know he always chose the correct way, but still that potential had to be there or else how can he be a bridge? Mm-hmm. How can he be a bridge? Marty, I think you had a question number two. No, it just, it just was uh, the thought, like Bill said, what, what did, so what, what you just said is Jesus never did deny what God requested, like giving his life for this, the sins perfect, of the world. Perfect submission. Yep. In the smallest and in the greatest of things, perfect submission to God the Father. Okay, thank you. Other, I'd, I'd like to go back. I'd like yeah. to go back to to the healing of the that pool of Bethesda. That he didn't confess his sins before God healed him. He didn't. He no. didn't make. He didn't ask. He didn't ask God to to clean him up before he would heal him. God chose to clean him up then to heal him then and then yep. tell him go and sin no more yes mm. so the the idea that um that you've got to in order to be a christian you've got to come and confess your sin first and do all of that and then uh you can move on with your life as a as a christian god god will it will accept us just the way we are in whatever condition that we're in, and he will do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And a great point, Jim, and something I totally missed, and I'm glad you didn't, um, because it's been a failing of the church for centuries where we look at the fallen society around us, no matter what country you live in and what era you live in, and you, you, you look down your nose at the wickedness that's around you because you're going to church and you're righteous and, and you know, you want to clean everybody up so you can get them in church. And that's completely backwards. Um, God reaches out to people right where they are exactly. and, and, and deals with them where they are. And then after that relationship is formed, then he works on cleaning up the mess. Yeah. Yes, Bill. Yeah, yeah uh, likewise, Jim. Uh, and I, I was thinking about that. The woman who was caught in uh, in fornication and in adultery. Uh, I mean, she was about to be stoned, and she didn't ask for forgiveness. But Jesus says, "Neither do I." I mean, sin no more. Uh, our salvation is not on our faith; it's based on who Christ is. That, that's why the miracles are so different so many different times sometimes he says you can see sometimes he puts a little mud sometimes it's always different otherwise i'd say this is the only way and that was jesus we made things very differently every time and that's one of the beautiful things otherwise it would have been pretty much the way the pharisees were yeah. this is the only way to do so yeah excellent god god loves variety to keep us from getting in a box yes dana <laughs> I love the theme that we've been addressing throughout. God calls us first and we respond. An understanding and a relationship follows, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. We don't clean ourselves up. We don't have understanding first. We simply believed in his calling to us. And that's the way it works. I'm so glad it's that way because we are all a mess. And we respond first. Amen. Renew our minds and bring the understanding later. And I'm even praying for one of my, my youngest brother to do exactly that. Because he wants the understanding first, and then he'll believe. Um, anyway, another another prayer request for another time. But I love that theme because it's a theme of grace and mercy. He's calling us. To Dana, him. he wants to see, then he'll believe. And God uh, clearly says, Mm-mm, it's believe, then you'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Any time for another question? Oh, yeah. We've still got uh, a few more minutes. Um, You ask about whether uh, some people think it's crazy that Jesus asked whether he wanted to be healed or not. They say, well, it's obvious he was waiting to get in the pool to be healed. But as I look back over Jesus' uh, teachings and everything, 
I believe that he was always a gentleman and he did not force things on anybody. He wanted to make sure what they truly wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that was in keeping with the way he usually did things. Mm -hmm. Plus, I used to think about when I worked for hospice, <clears throat> after I took care of their medical problems, I would usually ask them if I could pray for them. Mm -hmm. I was always amazed when <clears throat> I had three or four people that declined a prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and they belonged to a certain ah. sect but nevertheless they declined a prayer and i always thought that was kind of unusual but i certainly honored that yeah. and um i just i just happened to think of that that um <laughs> that we do have to always always honor people's decisions like i've talked to some homeless people or people that were camping out in the woods and i had the means yeah. where i could have obtained a, way to help them get a place to live and so forth and it always amazed me when some of them declined that they liked their their way of life living out in the woods in a, in a condition of what i would consider pure squalor but uh that's what they liked so you have to honor some things and, and lee well said because that's how god treats us i mean he doesn't force us to love him he the reason we are made in his image versus dolphins or killer whales or, or chimpanzees or what is we, we can choose. Mm -hmm. We're sentient beings who can make a choice. And in that ability to choose, we can choose to reject him and reject his love. And that's the risk that he took when he created beings that were like him that could choose. And, you know, if you if you reach out to somebody and they don't want prayer and they don't want help and they don't want to change, um, that's all. I mean, look at the Pharisees that he's talking to. I mean, they saw miracle after miracle and they were aware of all of his miracles because they were trying to get him. And very few, now there were some that did turn. We already spoke about Joseph of Arimathea. We were going to talk about, um, um, I'm sorry, Nicodemus. And we're going to talk about Joseph of Arimathea. I mean, there were some in the religious leadership that did soften their position, but these guys didn't. Most of I mean, Jesus went to the cross and these people were still hating his guts. And that's a choice. And you see it in the people and the hardness of their hearts. Mm -hmm. Bill? I have a huge struggle in life and with... Uh, choice. Uh, for example, uh, what's happening right now with Hamas, Gaza. These people have for generations now been raised to hate the Jewish people or hate Christians, and they do that in a very horrific condition. It's, a, it's really subhuman. Uh, the West is guilty, everybody's guilty for what's going on, but these people haven't had a chance at all I believe to know uh, Christ. Yeah, you can. They have lived under a prison of hate. And I, I have a hard time understanding. I mean, because what, how, how, how to reconcile that? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it's very easy to say, you know, hey, Israel is good, Hamas is bad. Uh, Hamas is bad. I understand it. The people in Gaza elected Hamas. But for, like I said, for generations, 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 these people have only known one thing. It's like saying, I don't eat pork, I don't eat that. I and mean, as an example, that's all they know. Uh, they How how are they denying God by not knowing him? Uh, it's just, it's a struggle for me. It's a struggle for me. We'll save that for another day, Bill. That's a little bit... Mm -hmm more than we have time to go yeah. into today. Okay. Rachel Rachel had a question and I want to get to that. Okay. My comment is um, I've had MS for 23 years. Uh, I am so blessed because his grace is sufficient. Of course, I would like to be healed. I would like to be healed right now, but because I know that his grace is sufficient, I'm able to do what I need to do and know that no matter what, he is with me. 
He'll never leave me or forsake me. And I'm so blessed. I'm blessed to be a part of the group. But um, no matter how long I deal with this, um, his grace is sufficient. I just want to share that. I want everybody to know no matter what Amen. I go through, he's with me. He'll never leave me or Amen. forsake me. Let, me. let me tell you one of the ways Amen. that Rachel, Rachel is used of God in spite of her MS is Rachel writes cards. And she doesn't know. There's been some times that I was struggling with things. And I get a card from Rachel out of the clear blue sky. It's not an occasion. It's not a it's not a holiday. I just get a card from Rachel. And I, I got to tell you how many times that has lifted me up and encouraged me. Um, and guys, she is being used of God in spite of of her MS in spite of God not choosing to heal her. And I just think that is an absolute outstanding example of today's teaching. Amen. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And as we close and we're about two minutes <laughs> over, I'm going to close us in prayer today, but I don't want to leave Bill's bill. We've talked just in the past couple of weeks about how God has left himself a witness to all mankind, that no human being is without, it, it, it has an excuse or a way, they can't shake their fist at God on judgment day and say, I had no opportunity to know you. Because he talks about the creation and how that is his testimony to mankind. So even if, a, I think I used the example a white Protestant missionary from Ohio never got to them with the Bible. They're still without excuse. But I will piggyback on what you're saying. God loves everyone. God loves individuals in Hamas. He doesn't like what they're doing. He loves the Palestinians. He loves the people who live in Gaza. He loves the Israelites. He loves the guy in Ohio. He loves everyone and wishes that no one perish but that all have everlasting life. And I have to believe as God, he is fair in that desire. And all that we have in front of us, and you notice I didn't get on this broadcast and I say, I didn't say pray that Israel will annihilate everybody in Gaza. I didn't pray that. I didn't ask people to pray that. I prayed for the peace and safety of Israel because they are his people. They are unique they were unique, they are unique, and they will be unique in the fulfillment of end times prophecy. God is not done with his people yet, and we are just grafted on like a, like a branch onto a tree. We're grafted on, but Israel is still the main trunk that God uh, is fulfilling his ways with humanity with. So I don't want to be on the wrong side of that equation, even if God, even if God is using the Palestinian situation to somehow bring Israel back to himself. Um, I still don't want to pray for anything against Israel because as I started at the outset, you know, how many Babylonians do you know? Um, it just, it never went well for any people group that aligned against Israel. So, uh, but God loves all peoples everywhere, regardless of their ideology on an individual basis, wishes that they would be saved and goes to great lengths throughout their lifetime to give testimony to them.